All right. Okay. So uh, it's Rufus from Theodicy and Christian and James from Fugitive Poems. And we're all just having a little discussion today about uh, their new release coming out this month. So before we start, how did Fugitive Poems come around? <laughs> I know you didn't want me to ask that, but it's number one. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and that's, that's 100 percent fine. Uh, we were just talking about origin stories. James, we, we've got to come up with a different one that involves a villain doing something terrible to us. Uh, um, I was working oh, C with CW uh, could be that villain. That's, I was just thinking that. That's our, our day job. job. <laughs> the arch villain. We, um, uh, I was working with Michael Gracia, who's a good friend of mine. I, I'm a writer of fiction novels, short stories, plays, screenplays. I'm a lifelong comic fan and I wanted to be a comic artist. And when I discovered I had no capacity whatsoever for drawing, uh, I, uh, I decided to turn to writing. And the funny thing is I never considered, here, here's some of my art. When Sometimes when I have to figure out a comic page, I draw it out, but this is my skill level uh, that, that we're looking at right here. <laughs> so, um, I had never thought about drawing comics. And then Michael Gracia, our friend, asked me to, to write one for him. And I fell in love with the medium. And it was like brought back all of my love from, from forever of comics. And uh, one day I had an idea. I was writing his stories. One day I had an idea that unlike normally, it wasn't a novel. It wasn't a short story. It was clearly a comic. And I busted out this script and I gave it to Gracia to see if he wanted to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, James uh, proceeded to uh, 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 steal it. <laughs> I lifted it right off his desk. It was interesting. I'll take you can take it from there. So yeah, so I uh, I saw it sitting around, and Gracia had uh, left it out where I could see it. So I uh, I grabbed it and read it, and I was uh, pretty impressed and uh, taken, particularly with the uh, first page or so they uh he had this uh sort of metaphor for death and this uh, woman who's walking down the street she's got a long flowing scarf behind her uh which was a metaphor for uh for blood and the uh the story actually includes uh death himself he's one of the characters in the story so he's coming to reap this woman and uh anyways that gets uh uh, disrupted by our other uh, protagonists and the story goes from there so I was just really impressed with the visual uh, interpretation of the story because the way Christian writes them the uh, sort of sort of like a screenplay format so he, he gives a visual description of how he sees the scene uh, and he also then he writes dialogue out as separate so it's kind of like uh, reading a screenplay so I was real impressed with that. So I didn't really have a uh, background in comics as much. I came from more of a standard illustration and animation background, but uh, I decided to draw a panel. Her name is uh, Pam or Pamela and uh, with her red scarf. And I showed that to Christian and it's all history from there. He uh, walks in and James and I didn't know each other that well. We'd worked around each other for years, but two different departments. And um, he walks in and he just hands me this drawing. And it was the first time I'd ever seen an idea of mine drawn. And I was staggered by it. And uh, I, I said, you know, I was gonna do this in stick figures, but I guess this will do. No, I was <laughs> absolutely staggered by how beautiful it was. And um, uh, the the wind up, the short version of the next eight years is that this man becomes my brother. We form a partnership together uh, uh, for Fugitive Poems, our, our comic company. And um, we are having the time of our lives, not only working together and getting our art out there. And it's funny, my, my wife jokes that we we've got a mind meld going. Uh, and very often he'll say something. I'll be like, dude, I was literally just talking about that. Uh, so not only are we or thinking about that, not only are we doing what we have a passion for and putting these great wild stories out there, but we're getting to work with all these other incredible creators 
uh, literally covering five continents. Uh, we need to get Africa and Antarctica. Uh, that's that's the goal. So I need to find a writer or an artist in Antarctica. <laughs> and we need someone in Africa. Or a penguin. Uh, but we got a penguin, a multi-talented penguin. A literary uh, penguin. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we're meeting these incredible people. We've actually got a project going on with the uh, uh, two creators in India right now that may be one of our first subscription uh, uh, comics on fugitivepoems.com. Uh, it's been awesome. I, I mean, this is my happy place, and uh, I'm endlessly grateful to James for for making this happen. You, you do hear of those rare duos in comic books of the writer and the artist that always work together and they know exactly what the other one wants. I remember hearing uh, Garth Ennis speaking about Steve Dillon like that a lot. Uh, Brew Baker and Phillips. Yeah, that's another right. one. You, you see what they put out. And I, I think to myself, I mean, I know so many writers because we all know each other and we're all in the shadows uh, who are desperately seeking uh, Susan. I are desperately seeking artists. That was an 80s movie reference. I think you're I probably am way older than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't no, worry. I, I don't watch anything after like 95 anyway. Oh, OK. So, you know, the Madonna. Uh, a Rosanna Arquette film. <laughs> so uh, they're looking desperately seeking artists. And um, I get an idea at 2 a.m., uh, which it almost is for you, and write it down. And I know who's going to draw it. And I know that it's going to be better than what I was thinking, because that's what James does. He takes my ideas and then he shows them to me. And I'm like, oh, this is the line I always use. That is exactly what I had in mind and so much better. <laughs> Yeah, the collaboration is uh, such a huge part of what we do. We go back and forth, and I call it sparks. When we talk to each other about stuff, we just sit and, uh, you know, put our heads together, and uh, my drawing gets better because of what his input, and he goes in and writes in additional stuff because of my input. And uh, My writing gets, you can say the same thing, my writing gets better because of your art. Um, he'll... He'll do something to a background character and uh, that wasn't an important character, like someone on the subway. He'll just particularly put some spirit into them. And I'm like, well, now they're a character. <laughs> now I have to write a story for them. It's like being in a band. You, you contribute yes. part of the whole. Yeah. hundred percent. So what, uh, what's like the identity of foreign press when you're, sorry, um, fugitive poems. I've got FP written here. And do you know Foreign Press? I do. Do you know Kyler Merrill? Uh, no, I don't. I know them as like a submission box on a website. For, uh, Kyler Merrill is the head of Foreign Press. I'm actually in his latest book. Uh, I wrote a story with artist Jack Fantomi for Comics from the Kitchen, which they just had out on up on Zoop. Uh, so I and Kyler Merrill is in fact in Containment Breach Volume 3 and Containment Breach Volume 4. Oh, well, there you go. So that's very, it's, I couldn't believe when you just said foreign press. <laughs> the, the world of indie comics is uh, very incestuous, it seems. <laughs> in the nicest possible way. <laughs> and prolific. <laughs> in its incestuousness. <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, incestuousness. Incestuosity? <laughs> so when you're doing a, a publication, what is it that makes it, um, you know, definitively fugitive poems? What, what are you striving for? I think we're always looking in, in a world, at least over here in the States, we... Uh, it seems like every movie is kind of a remake of another movie, of a remake of this. Everything's kind of rehashed and redone. And the people that have control of the money really just, they want to be safe. They, they want to do these titles and stuff that they know are going to make returns. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, making money and so forth. But it does tend to squelch real creativity. So I think first and foremost, what we do with our anthologies and what we do with uh, you know, our one-offs, which are up and coming, is we always want to have something original. We want, tr you know, truly original, not not a mashup of this and that. You know, that's that stuff is fun, but uh, we 
I uh, one of the reasons why I really dig Christian's writing is it's nothing you've ever seen before. It's not just like, oh, th this sounds just like this, or this looks like just like that. I mean, of course, you know, with the world the way it is, things are going to resemble other things from time to time. But we really strive for originality. It's built, it's built into our process, and it's built into the process that we use for our anthologies as well. We don't take stories that are already made. Um, we will take applications and we look at people's artistic portfolios. We look at their writing samples. Uh, and then we try to pair them into usually groups where they don't know each other and uh, come up with something brand new and unique. And uh, Christian in particular uh, really hounds them and our, our senior editor, Mark Capitelli, really kind of hounds them if they're, if they're doing something that's, you know, too cliche or already been done a hundred times, we, you know, we steer them away from that. So I, I would say that's the main pillar of Fugitive Poems. Um, beyond that, we, uh, we're always told, I guess it's because of our age, that we have this like kind of heavy metal aesthetic. Um, mm. Him and I, he's a little younger than me. I grew up in the 90s listening to a lot of metal in the 80s uh i used to you know play in a band and i would always draw eddie from iron maiden all over my uh, all over my notebooks and everything and so my illustration aesthetic as we were talking about frank frazetta was that sort of fantasy uh 70s kind of on the side of a van uh airbrushing and uh, album covers from you know the uh, you know a lot of the British bands the Jews Priest and the, uh, mm. Iron Maiden and so forth and Motorhead and uh, you know just sort of I, I think that's where I really started to get my aesthetic from was some copying those guys uh, early on so uh, I I would say you know that originality and that sort of heavy metal uh, throwback sort of feel. Rufus, yeah. what's the, what's the makes... profanity rule on, on this interview? Oh, say whatever the fuck you like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always joke that our aesthetic is batshit. That, that we're just, <laughs> that's what we're going for. And it's, that, it's where jazz meets heavy metal, uh, where, where that explosion of creativity happens and you do something and I do something. Uh, James is talking about uh, me hounding people. We have a creative process, unlike most other anthologies. We don't tell you what the anthology theme is until you've applied and we've accepted you. So all we say is Fugitive Poems is a new anthology coming out. If you want in, give us your three best pieces of writing, your three best pieces of art, sequential art, your three best pieces of sequential coloring, lettering, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we pick people. Mo occasionally we get a team. Like we're incredibly lucky to get J.L. Collins, J. Sheik, uh, Leland Bjerg and Marissa Brignall um, on uh, uh, volume two as a team. And then uh, that led me to be able to wor work actually with Jay Sheik, who's got Hush Ronan from Band of Bards Comics uh, on a comic in volume three of our series. But mostly people come in individually. So what we do is we pair up the people we accepted and then we email them and we say, all right, here's the theme of the book. Here's what we need you to do. You need to come up with a creative prompt. It can be anything, no more than three or four words, but a creative prompt. And whatever comes to mind, send it to us. So oh, let's say, Rufus, you come up with uh, uh, the Guardian of the Sacred Tree. James comes up with uh, Terrible Twos. And I come up with Celestial Machinations. What we do then is we shuffle them all around and then redistribute them. So that you may end up with celestial machinations, I end up with terrible twos, and James ends up with guardian of the sacred tree. And what they have to do is write a story under the umbrella theme of the book that somehow includes that creative prompt they got. And that's that's the jazz, that's the metal, where no one's pulling a story out of a desk. They're writing stuff that we they've never written before. And we play the game too. Uh, I got... Des uh, desperate humans in deep space and i don't write that kind of science fiction that's not usually in my wheelhouse i love to read it but that's not generally where i write and i almost panic but the game is the game 
And that's what I was assigned. And I was driving home one day and I had an image of two teenagers with just dressed normally floating out in space, suffocating. And the story came to me around that. And it went from there. And it didn't all take place in space because I just needed to include that prompt. Uh, and But it did suggest a story I never would have thought about mm. if not for that. And that so that's how we do it. And that's that that metal that hit it. Let's make this happen. What do you got? Explode it. That's that's that feeling that we go for. That uh, little secret Santa trick of yours was something I planned to ask you about. So I'm going to have to cross that off the list. <laughs> Secret yeah. Santa, that's great. <laughs> uh, I do have a. This might seem a stupid question, but I do have to ask it. Uh, why is it fugitive poems? Where do the poems come in? So, in the seventeen and eighteen hundreds, whenever they published a bit of uh, uh, doggerel or maybe some actually good poetry that had no author attached to it it was called journalistically a fugitive poem uh, uh, and these were poems that had escaped from their author basically uh and uh, there were there's also fugitive verses and lord byron's first book was fugitive i just forgot pieces <laughs> i'm holding it but i couldn't remember <laughs> fugitive pieces and i i had heard that term i'm a big fan of john keats and uh his posthumous collection, which has some of his best stuff in it, uh, including his holy trinity of wine, women, and song, uh, much less sacred than his regular writing, <laughs> uh, was called Fugitive Poems. And I was so taken with this concept uh, that I just love the idea of writing that's uh, what was the characters in search of an author, Pirandelli, right? The, this idea of, of creation that's escaped its creator uh that uh and, and and more than anything how fucking cool does that sound fugitive poems uh so i named the first issue the issue that james drew the one that he purloined off our friend's desk i named that issue fugitive poems and then i liked it so much i said screw it the name of the series is going to be fugitive poems and then james and i decide to form a company it's like well we need a company name and i said all right just shoot me down there's a stupid name. It has nothing to do with comics. I was thinking Fugitive Poems. And our first moment of this is going to work with us, he went, oh, it's great. Let's do it. And, and so Fugitive Poems was born. It, it is a good name. And now you've explained it, it seems even better. You've got like, a, like an antiquarian punk rock vibe to it. Yes, yes. Love that. <laughs> we also, um, we lucked out with the... Uh, search engine optimization that you put in fugitive poems we come up out up at the top because there's no one's used it there's a couple <laughs> of uh people using fugitive poet but uh we usually come right up without any work in that horrible world of uh social yes, media marketing <laughs> which we're currently in yes <laughs> this part we like we're, we're, we're uh we're old fashioned. Sitting and talking with someone is our favorite way to get things out. Uh, coming up with the perfect keyword for Google is, uh, 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 for those of you reading this article, I just mind shooting myself in the head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm completely with you. I'm, I'm aware social media is a thing, and I'm aware that you can check out your friend's holiday pictures on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the extent of my knowledge. Oh, that is okay. the height of its accomplishment. <laughs> you could definitely be one of our employees. <laughs> we have no familiarity. Although we 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 did just uh, bring on a uh, a younger woman who's doing some social media stuff for us. She's kind we of more in well that, with more in that uh, that generation that kind of understands that running around videotaping yourself all day. That just makes no sense to me. Unless, unless I, the only time I to video, to video myself when I was a kid is if I was about to do something really stupid on a skateboard or a bicycle, that would be it. <laughs> the, the, the jackass criteria. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the whole, whole my beer can, uh, theory. Well, since we're talking about, uh, the digital age, I mean, we're, we're all, 
I think everybody in comics is sort of wondering where the future is going, what, how, how much digital comics are going to take over, so on and so forth. But your comic is definitively physical. You got 162 pages, you got a satin cover. Uh, it feels like you're making a statement in a way that, that there's a reason not to, uh, not to read it online, but to actually buy it. We, we do sell it digitally because you can, you know, you can only fight the tide so much. And I understand <laughs> that people like it digital that, you know, this room is my, this is my office and it's my favorite place in the universe. And my wife can barely step foot in it. Why do you have all this stuff around you? Doesn't it make you claustrophobic? Every inch of wall that's not on the shelf has paintings on it and art on it. And th this is, I just want it. I want osmosis. I want to take it all in. And I know there are people that are trying to minimize their lives and have digital. If you send me a digital comic, unless you need me to edit it, I will never open it. I'm waiting for the physical copy right. to arrive. I want to hold that motherfucker. I want to flip through it. I want to be able to do this and this. I want to be able to, I want to just be able to turn the pages. I want that full effect. When I write, I am all about the page turn. I am so hyper aware. I will add or take away pages from a comic if there's a page turn that's screwed up. I need the page turn revelation. Not that it's a revelation on every page turn, but I will not put a revelation on the second page. Because you open it up, you see it immediately, and it's done. And the idea of, I mean, we put our first po uh, poems, <laughs> our first comics out digitally because we were getting our footing. And you had to scroll through them on our website. And we did that because we were getting attention. We were starting out. But it, it broke my heart. Um, I want to see the full page. I don't want to just see a panel. I, I mean, James lays out a panel, a, a page rather. It's got a flow to it. It's got an arc to it. It's amazing. And then we work with these great letterers, uh, Tom Linet and Kevin Lintz, and what they do with the lettering, and James does lettering as well, what they do with the lettering to help your eye flow through. It's an art. So just going panel through panel uh, is um, it's not what I'm looking for. It's not what I want. I will say, however, that we were at Terrificon, the uh, big Connecticut comic convention, over the weekend, we met these uh, gentlemen who uh, are doing a comic called The Digital Pools, which I have around here somewhere. Um, and no, it's in the other room. And they've teamed up with a company called Macro that seems to be doing some really energetic digital comics where it goes from panel to panel in almost an animated way. And it looked really cool. And it's probably something we should get into. Uh, but it's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the other uh, reason I think print is superior is from a very technical point of view, when you're looking on your screen, whether it's your tiny little phone or your, you know, the biggest computer screen you can have, or even your television, you're really dealing with, you know, 72 dots per inch or pixels per inch, right? So there's that level of uh, clarity and uh, tightness in there, but if you go print, even a even a bad print at 150 DPI, you're still doubling the number of dots in there. And uh, I try to work with our uh, the people that we put in the books. I try to work as high as uh, 600 DPI. You know, it doesn't always make it quite to the end, but uh, there's always something to be said there when you look, particularly at you know visual art. You know a, a typical Microsoft Word document is printed at 600 dots per inch. So you can read that fine print. So take that into the visual world and you're seeing a whole lot more when your print is out. There's nothing like to me seeing uh, seeing my stuff. You know, we, we do so much stuff that I'm not always proofing it and printing it because it's expensive. It's amazing to go and see it. Most recently, Christian uh, went to, uh, where'd you go, Staples? Staples, the office supply go to, store. Go to Staples to uh, to print out a, a poster for our um, our new Kickstarter launch, and it was so exciting to see our latest cover in print. It just it makes a whole different impact on you with the print layout. Um, this this is not the one he's talking about. This is Volume Three, but the first time that he showed it to me on the screen, I was blown away. When we received these books, 
looking at this physically, I didn't even know what, what to think. And when I printed out the new one, volume four, Monsters, Beasts, and Bastards, I was in business mode. I was like, oh, we need this image. We need it for Terrific Con. We need a poster. Blah, 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 blah. I run over to go pick it up. I'm like, okay, I got to pick it up. It's raining like crazy out. I got to cover it so it doesn't get messed up. Blah, blah, blah. I run in the house. The kids need something. Blah, 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 blah. I go to take it out just to make sure nothing got screwed up. And I went, Ugh. all the bullshit of the day just washed away. And I was like, oh, I've seen this image 20 times, but I've never seen this image. Mm. <laughs> There's something about that physical. And when I got this copy of Containment Breach Volume 3 of Clouds and Ether, this has been my favorite cover. I, I'm, what, what would the kids call me? The kids would call me a James Lines stan. Uh, I, I am an incredible fan of James's work. And uh, this was my favorite cover he'd ever done. And I've loved all the others. But now with the new one, uh, which I don't have to show you, imagine it here, uh, um, because it's not printed yet. And that, that poster I'm talking about is in the car. Um, this it's incredible to be able to look at these and I, I don't know which I prefer, but there's something about flipping through a book and getting to look at what you want to see and mm. these incredible artists and holding it and turning the page and being able to easily go back and double check something uh, that to me is sacred. And I feel the same way about reading a book about art, looking at a book with art in it. I, I There's something sacred about turning a page. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the chunkiness of the book you were holding up, I mean, it's you're putting out a, a trade pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you're a chunky guy, you got to put out chunky work. <laughs> there, there is definitely something in in the the physical world of comics that that doesn't seem to translate digitally, and it's it's ever. I mean, even going to your comic store. I think what everyone likes about going to the comic stores, you're surrounded by like this pop culture shrine in a way. It's it's hard to duplicate the the physical feeling of it. Yeah. Yeah, there's that whole physical aspect. As soon as it's in the quote unquote real world, it, to me, it takes on a whole different aspect. You know, a digital copy lives lives out its life and you can copy it. It, you know, an infinite amount of times. I suppose you could do that with a printed copy too, but money sort of prevents, you know, that kind of run, even a big run, like a Marvel type run that there's a limited number that go out, you know? Um, I think that takes it into a different realm. And it, uh, you know, just a, from a larger sense, just going to a library and seeking out books and stuff that you're looking for. And even if they're just print books, um, it's a, uh, it's something that's different. You know, with that said, though, your original question was, you know, what do you think the future is? I, I think we would be um, rather dim if we didn't, you know, sort of embrace the world that like anyone under 30 sort of looks at. Most kids, I call them kids because I'm an old man. So even up to 30, I consider you a kid. Um, we'll look at we'll look at stuff in digital format and they kind of grew up that way. So they look at it that way. That, that's why. Um, I think it's important to, to sort of have that aspect as well, uh, that, that project that Christian was talking about, it's relatively new, uh, provides an interesting, uh, pay structure. Actually, you get paid by finger touches on your work. So you submit the work for free. And then if someone plays around with your, um, your file and, you know, backs up to read another section or something, that's how you get paid. So it's a real interesting monetary way of doing it and also uh you get that sort of hyper um, almost movie experience because I, I think a lot of kids you know especially younger younger ones they grow up with the movies and the you know the the difference between the book versus the movie and so forth has become so um enmeshed right before you know when we were younger it, it seemed to be more separated. Now it's all that, you know, truly, you know, I think multimedia, at least over here in the States is a word that was overused for a long time. But I, I really think that we've truly reached that, that time where you're consuming the same product, the same stories in multi different ways. And that's one of the things that uh, if we ever have time. We want to, we want to pursue that. We want to have animations of our, comics we want to have uh 
card games made from that, possibly board games. We're trying to reach into all of that and uh, get our work out. So it's a, uh, we call things a fugitive poem. It's a fugitive poem, whether it's uh, no matter what medium we're putting out. So I, I think that's the future is, you know, it's not just print. It's uh, embracing all the different media that you can do now and all the, all the advances that have been made in uh, particularly to me, the animation world, things that I used to slave over for hours and hours and days to get things done. Now you can press a button and all of a sudden it's raining in your scene. You know, that kind of thing is uh, really amazing. Uh, and that's, that's stuff that we're at least looking into at this point. Hmm. Well, I have to uh, also ask about the practicalities of, because you black guys are both editors on this as well, aren't you? Yeah. And you've, got, you've got 160 something pages. I mean, what's it like having to, to edit all of that, uh, all that content? Wait a minute. It's worse than that. We did books three and four at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was more like 300 pages. Volume one was a, um, it's called, it's, it's Containment Breeds Volume One Quarantine Chronicles. And you can imagine why we were, we were no just, idea. You know, <laughs> it only happened in America. Um, <laughs> there was, uh, it was the beginning of, of quarantine. And I saw these people putting out anthologies and I got to thinking, how quick can we do one? Uh, just messing around. So we put it out like a 90s zine. Articles, essays, comics, all kinds of stuff. Pinups. Uh, and it turned out to be popular. And that was pretty cool. So we put out a call for volume two and we we're going to do another zine. And uh, so many people applied that we ended up doing 162 page Containment Breach volume two. Uh, myth reborn is all mythology turned on its head in some way we put out a call for volume three and so many people applied that were excellent that we were going to have to turn away a throng of talented people and i can't remember now if it was james or mark damn whoever it was who said what if we just do two books at once and a bunch of idiots really like, oh it's a great idea it's a great idea and we did it and we almost died uh, but it was incredible. Uh, James is the art director on the project. Um, I am the uh, editor-in-chief, and Mark Capitelli is the uh, senior editor. Uh, and he works his butt off, too. And uh, we're really very in charge of the first couple of steps, which is send me a pitch. Once we put your team together, send me a pitch. Send me your script. We're going to work on the pitch, okay? Send me your script. And we're very hands-on. Again, we're all, even Mark, we're all professors. And um, we're, and I don't mean like micromanaging, I mean like helping. Like we don't just say change blah, we explain why and we give you theory and concepts and et cetera. And uh, then give me the script. Okay, give me another draft of the script. James doesn't come in until the line art. And he checks out the scripts too, but he really doesn't come in until the line art. And then he does what we do with the scripts, he does with the art. Mark and I stay involved because we're looking at the sequential aspects. You know, it doesn't make sense for this panel to go to this panel because it doesn't tell the story right. Uh, James is also looking at that, but very much looking at the art and helping people with shadowing and three-dimensionality and, and a bunch of other stuff that he could tell you that I don't even know what the hell he does because it's magic to me. Um, and, uh, and then we go from the line art uh, and then pencils, or or I shouldn't say that, um, layouts, and then pencils, and then inks, and then colors and lettering. Um, and uh, it's a long process. So we come up with production schedule, the whole nine yards. And we are lucky enough to bring other editors. We've had Dustin Luke Nelson. We've had Jordan Patrick Finn. Uh, we've had uh, Casey uh, uh, Allen. We've had a bunch of great people come on board. Uh, Travis Hill to uh, edit for us. And uh, Leland Bjerg has been a great editor and take a little bit of the weight off, but as editor in chief and as senior editor, Mark Capitale, we're still overseeing the whole thing. There was one editor we had on who had let a story go by uh, with their approval uh, that had no point to it. And I, I'm gonna, gonna be very vague here uh, because the story ended up being in the book and it's fantastic now. 
but I had let that let that stay over there. And I finally got around to checking one that wasn't mine. And I discovered that there, there was no the ending brought nothing to a head. There was no reason. There was almost no reason for the story, even though it was full of great elements. And the way my brain works, I could see it. I saw what needed to happen. And I had to jump in and I didn't want to step on the editor's toes. So I worked with the editor to work with the writer and the editor asked me to share with the writer what I was thinking and then I stepped out again and they came up with something which was not what I had suggested but was exactly the kind of way I wanted and uh, I was really 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 proud of them for that Um, we will not put anything in the book that is not excellent Uh, I've gotten enough anthologies in my I got an anthology from Dark Horse they did a noir anthology i mean it's freaking dark horse and as always with all the anthologies i get there were two great stories three pretty good stories and five mess stories two of which didn't even make sense and i feel like every anthology i've ever gotten is like that james and i make the comics we want to read i mean that's we make the comics that other companies are afraid to put out we're not shy about subject matter Uh, And we make the comics we want to read and we make the experience we'd want to have. And uh, if you're going to play in our sandbox and we want you to, you got to play by those rules. I want you to go out, do something you've never done before and make it great. Well, when you're working with so many creative teams from all around the world as well, uh, obviously there's a lot of benefit there. You've got so many different perspectives and styles, but is there also a lot of difficulty in like your artist and your writer in different countries, just communication wise? We've had, we've had a few instances where people have kind of clashed heads, but you know, we, we've sort of, uh, you know, sort of worked it out between them, but uh, you'd be surprised, especially now that we're, four books in how well this actually goes off uh we've we got a lot of teams that go beyond our stories and go and work for other anthologies as a team or even you know start making their own books and so forth um it's a very uh uh, congenial sort of attitude that people have um i think part part of it is we provide a structure that we've noticed we work with within other anthology structures and there's you know kind of a lack of a structure i think being being teachers we know that you have to give a a set of rules to people you know particularly artists you know they'll go all over the place if the if you let them but if you give them a, a roadmap and you uh make them stick to it you know it's, uh, it's it tends to work out better and also, if you know if someone screws up, uh, we're all we're always very um, sort of understanding, it, you know, at least to a point. You do have to be professional, but you know, we we try to make room for people who are or once were amateurs or unpublished or uh, don't know a lot about digital design and you know do everything on paper and don't don't really understand the ins and outs. When I start talking about the technical stuff that you know is important for a to put it in a book layout. Um, yeah, so it's it's really I I'm constantly surprised at how well the team stuff works out. I, I think because people understand, and you know we've got a couple under our belt. Uh, I think people understand that if they do their job right, they're going to get the book in their hands, and that doesn't always happen with an anthology. So they 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 respect us because they know. We get it done and we we've done a couple now and uh if you you know if they play their cards right and do their job they're, they're going to get that um that payoff which is you know your story in a real book one that you put on your shelf and sell and so forth i think that's part of it as well uh we've developed uh a reputation that deserves a certain amount of respect because we get it done we don't we don't just leave you hanging we're not unprofessional ourselves. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of rubs off, uh, you know, when you're, when you're professional, people underneath you are going to believe in you. And then of course, follow through. Mm. 
How do you go about pairing your writer artist teams? And what, you know, you need a sort of artistic eye to see what script's going to go with whose style, right? Yeah. So we we review. Uh, Christian reviews the the scripts uh, now with uh, Mark as well. I review the art, and then we kind of sit together and we all make up a master list. Uh, Christian has his list, put you know pair stuff together. And, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a list, and we'll we'll sort of bang uh off ideas off each other and um say this guy looks good with this and we'll compare um you know these different things and sort of come up with ideas for similar styles this this person has this skill set this person has this particular style uh that might go well with this um this writer and and so forth and, uh, it's kind of it's kind of cool because um when James says that we look for people with similar styles uh, uh, and skill sets, it really is the skill sets. We've put together some seemingly disparate people uh, because we had a feeling that it would push them both to a new level. And we've been we've been right every time. Um, so we look for people. It's not just, well, he draws sci fi and she writes sci fi or she draws horror and he writes horror. Uh, we try and be creative in our pairings because. You know, the goal that we have, one of our missions, and I know as a company in business, you're only supposed to have one mission, but, you know, fuck that. One of our missions is to, um, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> our number one secret is surprise, and it's our two secrets. Uh, <laughs> that's one of my favorite routines ever. <laughs> um, one of our missions is to raise the banner of other indie creators out there we were looking around we were screwing around on twitter and when we first started and trying to find out what was going on and how it worked and i discovered that there were so many incredibly creative human beings out there who were just not getting any play and i said well you know what we want to get play they want to get play let's just play and we'll put out you can't get published till you're published all right well we'll fucking publish you and that's what we did and um part of it is all right well one of the reasons you haven't been published it could be because there's a million fish in the sea trying to get published right people don't know that about fish but it's a scientific fact um and there's also there's also tons of competition and blah, blah, blah. but sometimes you haven't reached your potential and what you're showing people is cliche here's another cape here's another cape right oh look i did an anime character oh look i can do an anime character oh look this is the same anime character right and we're able to look at it well i can read a script and be like okay i love noir noir is my probably my favorite genre it's what i've studied the most and you are writing cliche noir right mm -hmm. so what if you wrote science fiction Take all those things that you love so much about noir, put them in a different place. All right, what if, what if, okay, you're not allowed to have it be the same thing it's always been. One of my things that I'm known for is I'm a hatchet man when it comes to what I call the Biggie Smalls ending. And the Biggie Smalls ending is, it was all a dream. Right? I cannot stand stories that, and then she woke up and everything was fine. Or, and guess what? Those two cowboys were actually toys and a child was playing with. Drives me out of my fucking head. I'm like, I took this entire journey. I took this, like, getting interrupted at the last moment of sex. I took this entire journey. And you're like, ah. But it turned out he was just imagining it. No, I don't want that. So we'll see people sometimes that have incredible talent, but they've fallen on cliches. And I am a uh, firm believer in creative limitations. I love creative limitations. Like, oh, well, you could do anything you want with it. No, 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 no. Screw that. I'm going to have you write. You know, I had, I'm going to name drop here only because I'm so honored to have had him. This is not to make me look cool. It's to make him look cool. Uh, the guy that wrote the corrections, Jonathan Franzen, was a professor of mine in college, in grad school. And uh, he had me write a story. He said it had to take place on a boat. And I was young and brash and angry. And me and my buddy, Michael Flanagan, uh, who recently passed away, uh, we were sitting in a bar and I was like, fuck him. 
I don't want to write a story that takes place on a boat. I want to write whatever comes to my mind. And me and Mike hashed out an idea that the story was going to take place at a Thanksgiving dinner. And it was going to end with someone getting knocked into a gravy boat. And that would teach him. Right? <laughs> so I taught Jonathan Franzen a lesson. No, no I didn't. <laughs> And I realized, and he pulled me aside, and he said, um, "He said I dig what you did. He said I like that you uh, you you have a problem with authority, but why couldn't you write a story that took place on a boat?" And I was like, "Oh, I didn't think of it that way. Why couldn't I? I mean, I could. I swear I could." <laughs> and I really got into this idea of creative limitations. And when I then sat down and said, "All right, I don't know, write, normally write stories that take place on boats. Why? I don't know." Let me write a story that takes place on a boat. And I came up with something I never would have come up with before. So that's that's really what we're going for. And when we pair people together, we're looking at their current ability and their potential or what we suspect is their potential. Um, and we are beyond honored when they ascend to a new level uh, in one of our publications. And you're going to see a lot of that in uh, volume four, Monsters, Beasts, and Bastards. Uh, there's people that uh, we've... Uh, we took a shine to, and they just whipped out their best work. Hmm. I'm I'm hearing, yeah, I'm hearing in there where you're talking about the boat. There's the the seed of the idea with the prompts there, isn't there? Yeah, abs, the absolutely. Right. So I you, teach yeah. creative writing with prompts. So you got like an earthing rod, but around that you can stretch out creatively as much as you want. A hundred percent. So you're on your fourth, your fourth volume now. Correct. And in today's terms, that is a longer run than anything the big two are doing. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it seems strange to talk about four issues as longevity, but in today's market, it is. It seems with an indie anthology, two is like the, the Rubicon. If you can get past two, you're probably around to stay. So what, what do you attribute your, you know, the fact that you've reached four? I think it's uh, my good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it part, part of it from a personal Christian and I, we're, we're just excited that people are interested in talking with us and working with us and getting stuff out there. Um, I, Part of the four might also be that we don't we don't have a lot of business acumen. So you know, I, I think I think a lot of uh, what Marvel and and DC do is they 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 got these like suits that sit in some room and think about nothing but marketability of mar marketability of a product. We're not really thinking about that. We don't think that far ahead, right? So that's not really the reason. You know, of course we want to be successful, right? But we're we're not thinking. Oh well, you know, uh, the market value on this is you know here now, and it'll be twenty percent in in one year from now. We don't we don't have that kind of thought process. We're both artists, and we both do what excites us. And I you know I, I think the reason why we've gotten to four it's just you know every time we do this, we get more and more people that are interested and say, hey, you know, I want to do this as well. We've actually got a couple of people that have, you know, done stuff for Marvel and DC and uh, uh, Image Comics now. So we, you know, we're attracting people other than um, not not to put down other people that might have other day jobs and are doing this as, you know, their passion project. But you know, it, it, I think part of it is just that we're so excited that these are popular and selling like hotcakes, and that we're getting. We're getting people. Um, we're getting people out there. Uh, we're probably going to culminate this at number five, uh, and then you know, not not that we might finish with anthologies altogether, but this series, Containment Breach, is probably going to close out at five. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I just think from a personal point of view that we're just we're so excited that people are willing to work with us and. Uh, I'll stand behind. Uh, I, I think more so, very selfishly, this is the coolest thing that I've ever done for professionally, right? Uh, I, I've worked as a freelance artist and done graphic design, and I, I've never done anything where I'm like, 
holy shit, this is awesome. When we get those books in our hands, it's like a rush. Uh, when I was a when I was a kid, when I was a younger man, I I was in a uh, Judas Priest tribute band. I played bass, and uh, that's the only time I really well, you know, there's other times, obviously, in personal life, you know, you get that kind of rush. But you know, the professional world, it was, you know, when, when we get that book in our hand, to me, it's like standing on stage. Even though I never went beyond, we never went beyond like pubs. You know, we just, you know, played in bars and pubs and so forth. But that rush of standing on stage and having a whole bunch of people yelling and screaming while you're playing guitar. And uh, it's you get I get a similar feeling with, with that when we hold that book in our hand for the first time. And uh, yeah, I think that's a part of it. You know, we're just you know, we're, we're still relatively new at this. So I think that's why we've had so many, you know, maybe 10 years from now, we might have shorter runs or whatever. But uh, I don't know if that answers the question. You know, yeah. I, I always joke. I always joke with James. There's this great scene in *The Way of the Gun*, which was a uh, Chris McQuarrie movie with uh, Ryan Phillippe and Benicio del Toro. There's a scene where jo James Caan meets a Benicio del Toro, and he says, "So I take it you're the brains of the operation." And Benicio del Toro goes, "This isn't really a brains kind of operation." <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. I joke with James all the time. That's us. He talks about, you know, if maybe we should be talking about marketability and instead we're talking about, you know, it'd be fucking cool. <laughs> but people are digging it and that's fucking cool. You know, I, people are yeah. excited. I think people get excited when you're excited about your own project. You think about it, obviously, with your shirt, you're into music as well. Right. So there's there's those albums that you can listen to and you know that group of guys or women is just so into what they're doing. And that's that's the fantastic album. It's when the it's when the higher ups, the corporate types start saying, hey, well, you got to do something like this. This was, you know, this sold a million records and they, they start throwing their hands in there and, you know, manipulating and so forth that it becomes something other than the best album ever. And some of, you know, some of the greatest bands got enough and uh enough uh, freedom through their success where they they didn't have to kowtow to the uh to the record companies they just said you know fuck you we're gonna do what we want and if you think about the longevity the longevity of bands i think a lot of bands these days or even way back in the 90s or something they, they would do three albums right so the three albums were the ascent and then they made a lot of money on one particular album and then the uh, the business types got their meat hooks into them and that a lot of times ruined what was amazing bands, right? Or someone would uh, someone within the band would get too big of a head and start to take over the too much of the creative aspect. Um, and we're, we're, we're still in that sort of love affair with what we're doing, the love affair with the medium. So uh, I... I think that has part to do with the longevity. I, I never believed ever when I heard someone say, I love what I do. And every day I go to work, uh, it's it's like I'm not working. I've never had a job like that before, but that's what Fusion Poems is to me. I could do this all day and I do do this. I do this all the time. Uh, I work as many hours on this as I do on my job. And uh, I just, I, I love every second. Of course, there's frustrations and so forth, but it's that, Creative output is the, that's the, the, you know, the inception of what, you know, what we're doing. And I, I, I think that kind of explains how we had that longevity. Mm. No, I, I can certainly believe that. And when are you taking submissions for number five? We have not opened that yet, but it uh, uh, looks like we'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to we got to get right now. We're in the middle of our uh, Kickstarter campaign for volume four and uh, and we ship to England uh, and all over the place, all over the world. Thanks to pirateship.com, uh, who has made it possible to be affordable to ship all over the world um, up to a certain poundage. But um, so I'm not sending you the Maltese Falcon by mail, but I will send you a book. Um we uh we're gonna next year we're gonna be working on uh our first one shot 
uh, which is only available, the first chapter, which is only available in Containment Breach Volume 1, Quarantine Chronicles, which we are actually retiring that physical book. It'll still be available digitally. And if you go to fugitivepoems.com, you can get all our books there. In fact, you can still order Volume 1 there uh, while we have a stock of it. And that stock is dwindling. Um, but it's the only place that you can see the first chapter of River, which is going to be our one shot. Uh, and then we're probably going to be handing Containment Breach Volume 5 over more so to Mark Gibson Capitelli, our senior editor, and I'll still be involved in writing for it. Yeah, that's Containment Breach Volume 1, Quarantine Chronicles. Uh, and um, so, and this is, there it is, that's River. It's the last uh, pages of the first chapter. Oh, can't see too much of it. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm giving away the reveal because I opened up the <laughs> <You, laughs> There we go. So Rufus, uh, James, can you, oh, can you go up to the top right corner? All right, my boy getting his face cut off. I wrote that this guy has his face cut off across, like a bisection. I said, not his head split across. Well, James drew that, and I didn't even know what to do with it because it's completely atomic, uh, atomically correct. Uh, <laughs> to the point where where I, for the first time in my life, understood my allergies. I'm like, the sinuses go up that high? That's why I always feel terrible. <laughs> so my, my best medical uh, information came from James drawing a face being cut off. <laughs> <laughs> and that's but, also sorry. testament to what you were saying earlier, how when you, uh, you find an artist that just knows what you mean. Exactly right. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, yeah, so we're going to be doing volume five, uh, probably right after we do our one shot river. Uh, but we have other people's products. We've got some great, uh, we're going to be producing some great other artists work. There's a lot coming from Fugitive Poems. You can go to FugitivePoems.com. And more than anything, I encourage you right now to go to Kickstarter and search up Containment Breach, Monsters, Beasts, and Bastards and jump on that campaign while you still can. Because, uh, man, I was blown out of the water by volume three. And uh, volume four has me uh, uh, even more in awe. This is, uh, and I can say that I'm not bragging because we only have one story in the book. So it's other people's work I'm talking about. And they really brought their awe. Well, what, before we, before we close anything down, I'm aware that you have some merch on your website. Yes. Do you want to focus some? some? <laughs> what do you got? Check this out. This is a containment breach challenge coin bottle opener. This is solid as hell. And it was the stretch goal on our last uh, volume three uh, Kickstarter campaign. And I have opened over, I'm going to say 100. It's probably more like 200, but I want, don't want to admit to my alcoholism. Over 100 <laughs> beers with this. And it works beautifully. And it's such a cool logo as envisioned by James. And it says we are fugitive poems and we make comics. And uh, there you go. Um, and that is available. There's only maybe 15 of them left. Uh, and uh, that is available for sale for only $15 on our website. We have uh, incredible stickers. We have t-shirts, fugitive poems, t-shirts. Um, and uh, if you go on the Fugitive Poems Kickstarter right now, you can get some original production art from James Lines on some of the reward tiers. J James, let me show you this. James is such an astounding artist. I love this first page of this comic. There's so much going on. There's so much character. Mm. I love that first panel right there, right? He, what I was saying about what he's able to do. And the cool thing is that I've seen this in just pencils and inks. And uh, some of that is available for sale on, uh, on uh, the Kickstarter uh, for Containment Breach Volume 4 for our new story, Pervert and Moon. Not Pervert Moon. A lot of people get confused. Pervert. <laughs> that's what the, <laughs> the Pervert and Moon. Pervert and was the, the uh, um, methamphetamine that the nazis were taking that allowed them to stay up for hours and do terrible things with no remorse um it was uh there's an incredible book uh called blitzed 
Forgive me, author. Look up Blitzed. I can't remember his name. I'm blanking. I hate when I do that as a fellow writer. Uh, but it's about the incredible drug, drug intake of the Nazi regime. So we wrote a Nazi werewolf story with lots of Nazis getting slaughtered, which, I mean, who doesn't want that, called Pervert and Moon. And there's going to be original product. There is original production art from that available on the Kickstarter right now. Getting James's art is a pleasure. And you get to sit with the book and sit with the art, art and see how this was done by hand and what happened when it went digital and watch the process occur. You know, it's, as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, that sounds like a Nazi version of uh, how the berserkers were always taking their mushrooms. And then, of course, that's where the myth of the werewolf comes from. And before you, before I got to that conclusion, you said Nazi werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> that was the creative uh, process in microcosm, as you were explaining it. A hundred, well, you're, you, Rufus, you're a hundred percent on it. Look at that. That's page two. Oh, brilliant. Pervitin. They so were that's... selling this shit to housewives <laughs> to keep them ch- Tipper, while they did their housework and watched the children, they had it in chocolates. The housewives have two a day and you'll be happier. They were marketing <laughs> this shit like crazy. And if you got, if you were a Nazi soldier, they were giving you pack upon pack, like fucking Rolaids. And these guys were, this is how they invaded France. No one thought you could go through the Ardennes because it, you, it's too dangerous. You'll be stopped too many times. And like, well, not if these motherfuckers don't sleep. So they drug their guys out completely, and they just ran their tanks through, through, uh, uh, through France, and it was they just drugged out of their minds. And uh, reading this, in the, in I the just, fastest tanks in the war, too, that helped. Yeah, a reading that James told me that he found out. So very often I get a title in my mind, and the story comes from there. Um, sometimes I get an image in my mind, as I mentioned earlier, and the story comes from there. This time, James contacted me, and he says, I just found out that there was a Nazi werewolf brigade. And this is a real thing where they wanted people to think that they were, they were because they, Hitler had this obsession with the occult, uh, that they had werewolves. And it was toward the end of the war when they were losing, and they were trying to get the people mm-hmm. to rise up against the American GIs. And one of the ways they were doing this was by telling them, that, like a bedtime story, that the werewolves to come and kill you if you help an American GI. Uh, and they really tried to, to make this happen. And uh, James tells me about this. And he's like, dude, we got to do Nazi werewolves. And my brain is already going. And I'm like, holy crap, the possibilities here. Uh, what what are they really? What's going on? And uh, and so Pervin and Moon was, was born. And it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things that I have ever written. Uh, uh, for, in a very personal way. Uh, I just, it worked. It worked and I worked at it. I'm very, my writing happens or doesn't happen. I either write something with no effort at all. It's just like, yes, it was meant to happen. Or I'm banging my head against the wall and I realize I've got to, I got to abort. I got to jump shit. This one was a middle ground. I wanted to do it. I wanted to make it work. And um there were just elements that were just blockades in the way. And I, I'd text or call James about something and he'd be like, well, I wouldn't do that. What about this? Or how about this? Or, That's a good idea. Or, oh, you were going to get rid of that? Don't do that. Or how about blah? And I just keep, this was very much a creation. Usually I write and he draws and then we really meld together. Uh, this time the melding started in the writing process because it was his, his brilliant inspiration. And I kept, I'm very secretive about my writing until I've written the thing. This time I actually talked about it throughout and James gave me some really great ideas. Uh, so the melding actually started right from the beginning. And by the time I gave him the script, um, he was already drawing. He already had the ideas because he knew where I was going. This was a really, uh, it was a really cool process, this one. And, uh, and not a normal process for me. And it's one of the scripts I'm most proud of and proud of us for. I think people are going to go nuts for it. And that's that's coming out in one shot form, is it? No, that's our entry into Containment Breach Volume Four, a month oh, from current currently on Kickstarter. Did I do that smoothly? Did not seem like an average. <laughs> we, we actually did it perfectly. Yeah, two, 
We have two stories in this one. The other one is the complete opposite. Uh, it's called Dragging Aggie. And it's sort of, uh, do you know who Chuck Jones is? Ah, this is this is the story on the uh, the picture of it is on your press release, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. So we we had this like kind of real. I I had this different styles, and one of them I called the Chuck Jones style, sort of like a Bugs Bunny sort of feel. Um, base flat colors and you know over over the top colors and so forth. So we have that story in there too, which is completely different from. Uh, uh, Nazis and werewolves. It's uh, just a, what, an absurd story, but very entertaining. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. I think it's a great counterpoint to our, uh, our Nazi story. Not, not that our Nazi story is completely serious, but uh, it's a lot more serious than the uh, dragging Aggie. I, I think everyone's going to love that as mm. well. So you get to flex different creative muscles in the same book, eh? Yes, yes. That's a real short one that we put in. But yeah, no, the first one shot is going to be that river that we uh, we showed a couple of, couple panels from. And that'll be this year, next year? Uh, next year. So we got about, what, 20, I think about 20 pages done on it. It's probably going to be about 70 when we're done. Mm -hmm. So we got we got some work to do on that. Or I did. Christian's got it all right now. <laughs> nice. So the future of fugitive poems, you're sort of springing off in all manner of directions and one shots, possibly another anthology after this one. You got a long term plan as well as a short term. We do. Yes, we got various different mediums. We also got another one uh, coming out. Uh, it's called Clippers. Uh, Stripper Clip Sally, uh, which is going to be a sort of racy one. Um, oh, wow. You just dropped that. That's Rufus, you just got an exclusive. We have yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. We're going to we're going to be out working on those at the same time. Uh, putting those out. Another that one. We're probably what well, Christian. We, it, we keep going back and forth as to whether we're going to do single issues or or um, or an arc. You know, the yeah, whole arc. Is it going to be? Yeah. Is it going to be a trade arc, or is it going to be single issues initially? Uh, wow, I can't believe you said it that loud. Stripper clip Sally is going to be a shit ton of fun, uh, and uh, uh, I won't say I, I'm now. I'm desperate to talk about it, but I'm not going to say more. Uh, well, I am uh, too. That's a wrong title. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, so, I will tell you this: one night, James and I are talking about the gun that's on the cover here. And he casually says it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Was well, that's like an old carbine from the war, the first war? Yeah, that's a uh, uh, most in the gun. That's the uh, that's the Russian infantry rifle. Mm. Uh, World War One oh, up through World War Two. Nice. So he casually mentions to me that it takes a stripper clip, and I was like, "Whoa, stop!" What? It's a stripper clip. And he explains how it gets the bullets in. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I, my brain is gone already. I got this idea about a stripper and the blood, and boom, boom, boom. And it just went. And uh, I, we had been talking about doing a type of story, a kind of uh, 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 tongue in cheek sci fi kind of fun thing. And uh, but it happened. And then uh, uh, so I was sort of marinating on it for a little while while we finished editing Containment Breach. And then one night, I just, it was like everything that had been marinating uh, uh, just hit perfection. It, 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 it perfect, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for right now, but it hit perfection. And I wanted to go to bed. Like you right. must right now, as it's like 2.15 in the morning. Um, I wanted to go to bed, but I couldn't because it was coming out. It was, mm -hmm. No, no, and I had to sit down, and I wrote the first issue, and uh, it it worked, and it was fun, and ideas came out that I didn't even know I had. So then I wrote, wrote went and I wrote the first issue for another series we're going to do, which I am not as much as I like you, Rufus. I'm not giving you another exclusive yet, <laughs> uh, and now I'm going back to write the second issue of Stripper Clip Sally. I'm going to alternate them so that when James is done with what he's doing, these suckers are ready. 
and uh, while they're fresh in my head. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot happening. Um, we've got I've got a story I'm developing for another artist, uh, Jack Fantomi, who's going to be under the Fugitive Poems umbrella as well. Uh, I'm. This isn't bragging because I'm not saying I'm good, but I'm a machine. I I'm, I just have ideas 24 hours a day. Uh, it's either a gift or ADHD, but whichever it is, I'm working it. I, I know exactly what you mean. It's that feeling where uh, you can't go to bed unless you've you've got a notepad on your bedside table in case you wake up at 2 a.m. and you think, I got to write this down or I'll forget it in the morning. Yep. Yep. <laughs> do, do you do you ever watch a show, Seinfeld? No, I, I don't. There's a great I remember with the theme tune, but that's about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's a great it was a jerry seinfeld the comedian it was his show in the 90s there's an episode about he woke up in the middle of the night where he's a comedian the funniest joke he ever thought of and he wrote it down and he goes to sleep and the next morning he wakes up and he can't read it at all so the whole <laughs> episode all these things are happening to other people and they're like oh we need help blah. and he's like can you read this what do you what do you think it's all he's doing the whole time and i actually had that Oh, no, I brought it back upstairs. I had that happen with, I almost said it, with the other project I'm working on, uh, where in the middle of the night I woke up with exact, I actually woke up with the framing. Mm. I woke up with the framing in my head, which is interesting how writing comics has made me think so much more visually. And the framing gave me the dialogue. That's why I showed you this terrible piece of art. Uh, sometime, I don't even know which way it's up for it. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Uh, but sometimes I need to draw it out in order to, to understand what I'm going to write and how it's going to go. And the next day I woke up and I could only read half of it. Uh, so hopefully I got the good half. <laughs> 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 the, the thing that was going was gonna to make us icons of the future is left in the illegible part. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got that as well as, you know, like some flags and arrows on a big diagram telling you the general outline <laughs> the string <laughs> i've been a whole archive of christian's artwork i'm gonna put out a, a book about it someday <laughs> you you can put this in the back of the uh collected edition in the sketchbook section yeah yeah <laughs> i haven't seen that one this i was my struggling to follow, follow the narrative on that one <laughs> <laughs> I actually abandoned because of this. I abandoned this framing. <laughs> I, um, James I, mean, while, I, I I'll go down to Christian's house and I'll I'll just go through his his uh, office is an absolute disaster. So I, I'll go through his like piles of papers and just uh, just abscond with all his uh, artwork. Sometimes he doesn't want to give it up, but I I don't give him a choice. I just come and collect it all. <laughs> I'm like his slow nephew who he's really proud of. <laughs> Look what I drew. I, you, I ever, love it. Uh, you ever upload a bunch of that to your own submission so James has to look through it all? No, but now I will. <laughs> <laughs> I should send it to Phil Russert. <laughs> Phil Russert, it's the guy that we know he does the tragedy which is an, an awesome indie series philbo publishing i believe dot com i think i philbo publishing dot com um and I was, james cut this because james is apparently a nicer person than i am i was interviewing phil and phil's like just send me your submissions i will look at anything you send me i said anything he said anything i said send your submissions to phil He'll look at anything you send him. And he goes, that's right. I'll look at anything. I said, anything you send him, he'll look at. And Phil, he didn't catch it. He said, absolutely. I'll look at anything you send me. I'm like, anything you send him, he will look at. And Phil's like, I thought he thought I was crazy. He's like, yeah, that's what I said. I'm like, James ended up cutting that. I just imagined the horrors he was going to get in his email, which is all I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> He's changed his policy since then, I imagine. Yes. I won't look at anything at all. <laughs> Send him anything. <laughs> I uh, One of my nicknames for Christian is uh, Sower of Chaos. He's sort of like a Loki character. He just really enjoys messing with people. <laughs> at every level. 
<laughs> the trickster. James yeah. knows when I'm bored at a meeting, when I when I just throw a match out, I'll just raise my hand at a terrible meeting and send say something that I know is going to be incredibly incendiary. Like I already know Bob over there is champing at the bit to get into it. And I already know that the head administrator doesn't want the topic to come up and I'm bored out of my mind. I'm just like, hey, by the way, what about? And then I just sit back and I'm like, ah, oh, finally, it's an enjoyable meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm definitely seeing you as a sort of a coyote in the Native American myths or, <laughs> or a Gwydion that we have over here. Say that again. Do you know Gwydion? No, I don't. I've in heard of the, that. The um ancient Celtic Celtic myths that we had here before the Romans. Our trickster figure, our Loki, was a a fella called Gwydion who engineered a war so that his brother could uh, date the the king's cupbearer un, unnoticed. He started a whole war for it and then ended said war with his trickery. Uh, that's sort of where you get your, your Lokis roughly the same time, uh, two and a half thousand years ago or so. How do you spell it? Uh, G-W-Y-D-I-O-N. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'll tell you those those Welsh myths. If you want, um, if you want inspiration, we've got some wacky ones. That's for sure. He's got to yes. be in here, right? Mabinogion. Yes, he is in the second branch, I believe. That means that I did know and forgot, which <laughs> might have something to do with alcohol consumption. But I'll never admit to that. Yep, 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 yep. Did you get to the bit about Sly Slough Giffes? A long time ago, but yes. Yes. I haven't read this in years. <laughs> it was always my, my favorite when, like, there's always the Achilles, the Achilles heel that mythological figures have, and they can yeah. only be killed one way. And that fellow in the Mabinogion can only be killed if... Uh, he, he can only be killed with a spear that's been worked on continuously for a year during Sunday masses. And at the time of his death has to be, has to have one foot in a bathtub of water and the other half, the other foot on the back of a billy goat. Yes. <laughs> yes. I remember that. Yes. <laughs> Oddly specific. <laughs> These things happen all the time, Jeff. Yeah. That's how I get into the tub. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. Chris, you have to lend me that book. Absolutely. Mabinogian's incredible. I haven't read it in years, but I'm so glad you just sent me back. See, this is the kind of thing, Rufus, where I'm going to have another story tomorrow. Because <laughs> one thing leads me to another, to another, to another, and then there I go. I was, I was reading that book. Um... Only last month, I decided to go to Stonehenge. I thought, that's the book to take with you. Nice. And I looked up from it, and there were two ravens, exactly two ravens, sat on Stonehenge looking at me. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> 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 to quote the back of the Amon Amarth shirt, Odin owns us all. <laughs> <laughs> were, they, were they giving you the side eye? Were they like this? In as much as ravens can. <laughs> the cocked head. <laughs> yeah, they say ravens, uh, ravens can recognize you and uh, hold a grudge against you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they, if you hear never more, you know you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> On a bust of palace. <laughs> That's why I got rid of my bust of palace. <laughs> I had an English teacher when I was at school who uh, he had a pet raven that he had taught to to say never more. Oh, wow. You, you need several years to do that. It's easy with parrots, not so much with ravens. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it, the accomplishment may have cost him a future with a bride. But he's still <laughs> <doing it> <laughs> <laughs> Honey, he can almost say it. He can almost say it. <laughs> Give me some more time. Yeah, I'm leaving. 
We'll see if you can say that. <laughs> I'm going to the club. See you. That's the first thing the Raven ever picked up on. <laughs> see you later, love. See you later, love. See you later. In six love. years, stop saying it. Dear John. Dear John. <laughs> Do you think she's coming back? Never more. <laughs> Fuck you, bird. <laughs> Did he ever bring the raven to, to class? No, but we saw a video of it, oh. which could have been anyone's raven thinking back, but he was too weird for it to have not been him. See, now, if I had the ability to have a raven in class, I would walk into the first class with that every time. <laughs> squawk, squawking on my shoulder. That's well, chances are you take it outside and just fly off, and then you—that's six years down the shitter. Yeah. <laughs> As he says, piss, he says, "Piss off, I'm leaving." <laughs> I had a, a chemistry professor who walked around with a giant African hissing cockroach in his pocket. Wow. wow. Yeah, I I didn't love that. <laughs> it wasn't that my sounds, favorite. Uh, that sounds so exotic, you don't want to slip over and, and land on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stapes out of your out of his pocket. Here's oh shit, That's dog splat. <laughs> <laughs> Disappears into the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been great talking with you guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might, yeah, it's half two, so I might call it there. <laughs> but this is for three fun. hours and then go to work tomorrow? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll sleep till 12 or something. We can get you some whiskey and we can really make this conversation go. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What's that called? It's called Joe Got a Gun. It's my current favorite office whiskey. And I swear I didn't just say office whiskey, but it's my current favorite office whiskey. <laughs> this is when the writing gets a little bit slogged. I, uh, I might uh, come here for a bit of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so smooth. It's a, it's a, uh, a Kentucky bourbon, uh, ten not bourbon, Tennessee whiskey. And uh, they actually use the Jack Daniels facilities to brew it. Uh, but it's their own concoction. And I fell in love with the bottle uh, and ended up uh, falling into the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say office whiskey. Well, we've got it on tape now, so you, you can, can't deny it. <laughs> you can make out the title of the article. <laughs> I didn't say office whiskey. <laughs> Doesn't everybody have office whiskey? He's like a politician. He'll uh, can't, can't contradict himself like three lines in. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I never try. <laughs> Rufus, this has been an absolute pleasure. You are amazing and wonderful to talk to. This uh, this made my night. Oh, thank you. You guys have been fun as well. Thank uh, you. I wouldn't have stayed up this late if you were. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is a real seal of approval. <laughs> I have uh, not made it over to the UK yet, but now I'm adding Bristol to my itinerary. Oh yeah, well if if you live in Bristol, then it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yes. indeed. You know, it comes from. Do you know what Bristol means? I do not. It comes from the old English uh, brig stow, which is stow is in like you stow something. And Brig is in Bridge. So it's oh. it's the town that the bridge is in. Wow. Incidentally, the, ta the bridge that we're famous for wasn't built till like 200 years ago, a few thousand years after the town was named. But <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Interesting. So, so they were expecting a bridge? Uh, no, they had like a, when there was only a thousand people living here, they had a little bridge over some water. A rather inferior bridge? Yeah. <laughs> and we've got we've got the suspension bridge now that Brunel put up. Does your Bristol have a bridge? It does not. Oh well, then the name is completely inaccurate. Has hey, a lot Bristol. of <laughs> has a lot of inward-looking people. 
<laughs> short short mindedness um, and ESPN, which is uh, an American uh, sports channel, it's TV network. But I I also use uh, Bristol Paper, so it's interesting that um, I wonder what the connection to that is because uh, Bristol Paper. It, this is called Bristol Paper or, or Bristol Board. It's like a not quite a card stock, but definitely thicker. It's great for uh, ink. And it's called a Bristol pad. So I wonder where the, where the connection of that is. Maybe it was manufactured in. Yeah, in one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one. <laughs> yeah, either Connecticut or... Uh, my God. Oh, James is getting something. We both have offices that are full of nooks and crannies <laughs> of, of great surprises. Mm-hmm. And crap our wives want us to throw out. We're still paying. Oh, yeah. This this is it's so strange to me to see um American versions of things over here, but like with the same name. Yeah. It's like when I see American cheddar, I, I find it so bizarre. You you have the, like the it's the squares, right? Yeah. 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 Well, our, our cheddar is like a block of extra mature like crunchy cheese really it's a completely different kind of cheese yeah although it, i think you're th- you're thinking about the kind of more processed stuff we do have we do have big blocks of aged cheddar um which can be dry we call it we call it sharp over here so there's different levels of sharpness we don't we don't do the wheels of cheddar it's more of a block but um yeah we're we're uh, I live up in New, uh, New England, so a- every town like has the same name as something over in uh, over in England. Ah, uh, that's uh, where Lovecraft Lovecraft's from, right? Rhode Island. I am Rhode Island, as he said. <laughs> I am Rhode Island. Yeah, H. H. P. Lovecraft. Uh, Providence and uh, uh, Connecticut were big. Fu- uh, excuse me, big uh, areas for him to create fictional towns in. Mm. I have, a, I, have a, I have a t-shirt of Miss from Miskatonic University, and I've had people walk up to me and say, Oh, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> and I get I get to feel like a, a superior nerd. And it's like, wow, well, you don't know. <laughs> 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 and they're like, Yes, I'm in finance. How much do you make? And then I go off sadly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm smarter than you. <laughs> Well, I suppose well, it, counts, it counts as an injury question. You have a favorite Lovecraft story? Oh, the Whisperer in the Darkness is way up there for me. Mm. Uh, but I also love the Color Out of Space. Uh, but the Whisperer in the Darkness is so fucking weird. That it makes weird fiction look weird. This is the the Migo, right? My yeah, girl. yeah, the, the mushroom people and the ro- the robot head and uh, oh man, it's so good. It's so weird. Every time <laughs> I read it, I'm laughing my ass off. And I'm like, oh, Lovecraft, you really did something with this one. Color Out of Space is terrific, and there's a number of others that I that I love. The Dunwich Horror is great, and there's uh, there's um. A little early one. I can't remember the name of it. It just doesn't get enough attention. I can't remember what it is. Is Oh, Beyond the Wall Wall of Sleep is a great one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, But Oh, in the case of Charles... Well, now I got to stop answering because I love his stories. But the case of Charles Dexter Ward is another favorite of mine. And they actually did a terrific uh, graphic novel version of it. I can't remember the gentleman's name, unfortunately. But I don't see the other one I was thinking of here. There's a little one about a parade through a town that ends up being important in the mythos later. Yeah, that's the one where he ends up going subterranean. And there's, yes. yes, yes, you know what you mean. I'm always trying to, I've forgotten the title, but one Me where too. a very early one of his I think it's some guy who's just trekking through New England and yeah. he comes across a shack and there's an old guy that lives in there. And uh, I love that one. I forgot completely what it's called. Me too. 
<laughs> James, I've got I've got about 14 million Lovecrafts around here. James actually got me this one, which I, I adore. It's a beautiful, you know, the gold leaf and all that. It's a beautiful yeah, copy. Cool on, on the cover of that caught my eye on that. That, that. that is a lovely cover. The festival. The festival, yes, that's the one. That is, right? Yeah, the, the one where they, they go subterranean and there's the sort of cult. Were they fish people or was that just in... Well, no, that's Dagon, Dagon, right? No, no, Dagon's the one where he sees the pillar in the middle of the sea or an island that wasn't there. That's right, that's right. And the um, music of Eric Zahn is a hugely underrated one. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that one. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Oh, I got to reread that tonight. <laughs> All right, so we need to do another interview where we talk Lovecraft. And uh, uh, have you, uh, reading Lovecraft got me on a kick of reading his, uh, his the people that followed him, uh, like, and the people that inspired him. Mm. Uh, where is it? Lord, uh, what's his name? Well, um, Al, uh, Arthur Mackin was one, and Lord uh, Dunsany. That's the one, yes. Lord Dunsany, Al, uh, Arthur Mackin, uh, and uh, Black Blackwood. I can't remember, but I got once I got into Lovecraft, I then expanded into obviously Chambers with the uh, the King in Yellow and all that. Great uh, stuff, yeah. and, and that's very much what our our new book is. It's not a horror book. It's it's got horror in it. But it's very much weird fiction. Uh, I mean, this is a passion of mine. I love weird fiction, whether it's the old EC comics or creepy, right? Tales from the Crypt. Um, that weirdness that this is not just scary. This is something else. Uh, it's bizarre. It's odd. And Containment Breach 4, Monsters, Beasts, and Bastards, currently on Kickstarter, again, smoothly done, right? Uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is more than anything a collection of weird fiction. And uh, we we think people are going to be, we got great responses to uh, volume three. And I think people are going to be really taken with volume four. Containment Breach, volume four, Monsters, Beasts, and Bastards, currently on Kickstarter. Uh, it goes off Kickstarter on August 31st. You want to get on this now. And there are some crazy cool reward tiers, including tiers where I will edit your script or give you commentary on your script, your comic script, or James will look at your portfolio or a full issue of your art, or James and I will both uh, go over your issue commenting on writing and art. Uh, and these are reward tiers that are available. And for $130, which I think it probably should be higher, you can make a cameo in one of uh, one of our stories. And James just drew someone into our Nazi werewolf story. Uh, uh, for from the last campaign, and for a mere thousand dollars, if you happen to have some extra cash that you're looking to discard, uh, we'll write a comic short, you know, four to six pages about you, about your character, and <laughs> I can promise you that we will most probably kill you real good. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> all kinds of awesome reward tiers, containment breach, volume four, monsters, beasts, and bastards, currently on Kickstarter. Was the fellow who got his face cut off sideways a cameo by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> we should have made that someone we know. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we weren't thinking that uh, that way at the time. Well, the funny thing is that his face ends up being a plot point through the next three issues, lying on the floor. Uh, it, it ends up becoming an important moment as well. It's sort of <laughs> pan pancake face on the floor. <laughs> but that, yeah that 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 one's kind of python-esque if you think about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> should we have him say i'm not quite dead <laughs> <laughs> uh rufus we have kept you long enough sir oh no it's been an absolute pleasure yeah this thank you fun. thank you so much for reaching out and uh, providing an excellent night, and uh, I thank you for this terrific interview. Well, thank you for answering my question so fully. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir, for your time. Well, All right. 
the I'm so glad right you're a fellow Monomarth fan. <laughs> he's got to tell you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop the recording. Uh, but he's got to tell you his awesome Amon Amarth story. So, one, one, two, three, and.